I was lucky enough to travel a lot in 2021, visiting a lot of new parks and picking up 86 new coaster credits. You'll get to hear about the winners later this week, but this video is about the other end of the spectrum. What do I consider a loser? There's really two categories. You have your god-awful waste of space coasters. Those never had a chance to be good. You also have coasters that were just decent, but these fall way short of the hype. Of those 86 coasters, I picked out 10 that fit the bill. These are the 10 biggest losers for my new for 2021 coaster credits. Before we get started, if you could drop this video a like, I would really appreciate it. It really helps out the video and the channel if you do so. We'll look at the five coasters I just thought were bad first. All of these made my worst coasters list from last month, and we'll finish with the top five that I was disappointed in. Number 10, Tornado at Adventureland. This 1978 out and back wooden coaster is the first thing you see when you're driving to the park, and it does look pretty good from the outside, but when you're on it, it's a different story. I didn't go in with any expectations, so it didn't disappoint me. Airtime Mike gave us a pretty bad review when I asked him, but I was hoping maybe it would give me something. But it didn't. Mike was right. It was rough and there was no airtime. The only redeeming factor was the buzz bar restraint. That doesn't touch you at all. Adventureland just took out Dragon, but if they're looking for a plot of land for something new and fresh, they might want to look at this one. Number 9. Do Whopper at Maurice Piers. Wild Mouse coasters shouldn't get coaster enthusiasts really fired up. Sometimes they surprise you, like a certain one over in Michigan. You might see that one on the next video. I had never ridden a Zamperla mouse before I got on Doo and this thing sucks even for a bad mouse. Coast Rider is worse for those bad trims and the shin guards, but in terms of just the ride itself, it doesn't get worse than this. Slow zigzags and shallow drops, only to end with the most shallow dips. It's like something you'd build in Roller Coaster Tycoon, and even then, you'd end up with an excitement rating around 3. I want to go on something more exciting than Zigzag Coaster 1. Just say no to Doo Whopper. Number 8. Corkscrew at Michigan's Adventure. Believe it or not, I thought this would be a fun ride. I rode the original corkscrew, the one that's now at Silverwood, and that was actually fun. This was the first modern inverting model, something that aerodynamics could take and build off of, so you're not going to get anything crazy. Drop, turn, two corkscrews, and turn into the brakes. Unlike the one at Silverwood, this one dealt me nothing but pain. So shaky, so much headbanging. I'm really glad this was a short ride so I can get off as soon as possible. It's not like I came in thinking it was going to be great, but I expected something pleasant at the very least. It was anything but that. Number 7. Firebird at Six Flags America. This has a similar story to Corkscrew. I rode Patriot at California's Great America, another small B&M stand-up that was turned into a floorless, and I've enjoyed every ride I've gotten on that one. Firebird gets a bad rap in the coaster world. Lots of jokes about it being the smoothest B&M in Maryland. A tongue-in-cheek compliment, considering it's the only B&M in Maryland. And I'm no stranger to rough B&Ms. I grew up with Scream in my backyard. I'm used to the infamous B&M rattle. Firebird's problem isn't the rattle. It's the only B&M that I've ever ridden that slammed my head around. You're used to finding this with arrows over comas, those not-so-perfect transitions jerking your neck back and forth. But B&M has very smooth engineering, and it's never been a problem for me. Firebird was really the first one, and I was not expecting it. Combine this with a mediocre ride experience, and I consider it a loser for my trip. Number 6. Pirate's Hideaway at Casino Pier. It almost seems like this ride is trying to work you. Big, elaborate theming on the outside, desolate nothingness on the inside. The outside just has a spiral lift and two tiny drops, and then you enter the indoor section. All that's in there are tiny dips, small turns, and harsh trim breaks. It's the world's first bait-and-switch coaster. Maybe if Casino Pier wanted to invest some money, they could do something cool with the inside of that giant box, and that would distract you from the fact that the ride isn't all that good. Number 5. Excalibur at Valley Fair. This kicks off the five coasters that weren't bad. They just fell short for me. Excalibur was a very intriguing coaster for me going in. It's the same type of model as Gemini at Cedar Point, one of my all-time favorite aero coasters, and Excalibur looks like a more extreme version of that. It's also gotten some rave reviews, people saying it's a janky airtime machine, and I was looking forward to it. I rode it, and it was fast. It had a couple decent airtime moments, but it was over really quick, and it didn't even come close to living up to the hype. I was thinking it could be a borderline top 50 coaster, but it didn't come anywhere close. I need to get back to Valley Fair for so many reasons, but giving Excalibur a few more rides is near the top of that list. Number 4. Thunderbolt at Luna Park. You talk about a ride with potential. This has a vertical drop, airtime hills, inversions, all on a skinny out and back plot. But this road's so unbelievably janky. After my first ride, I thought it was one of the worst coasters of all time. Luckily, I got to ride it one more time in the front, and it wasn't awful. Zamperla really stepped out of their comfort zone for this model, debuting in 2014, and it seemed like they were trying to make this their signature coaster model. I think they failed on this one. 
Apparently, their second try in Alabama was better. But just talking about Thunderbolt, it was definitely a loser on my trip. There were potholes everywhere. The transitions were horrible. It was just hard to focus on the elements with a ride that janky. Number three, Steel Curtain at Kennywood. Here's a prime example of a coaster that's just fine. But when you're talking about a Hyperlooper with nine inversions, you're expecting a little more than just fine. It has interesting elements, a long track length, along with lap bars and a couple airtime hills. But I didn't feel anything with this ride. I know I'm not alone here, but a lot of people will also disagree. Maybe I rode it too early. Maybe the back row wasn't the best row. Whatever it is, it was forceless and it just flipped me around a whole bunch of times. It also had a rattle, which wasn't too bad, but not something you should expect from a two-year-old coaster. It reminded me of one of those big forceless B&M loopers. Those are just fine, just like Steel Curtain. I was just hoping for more. Number two. Max Force at Six Flags Great America. I wasn't too happy with either of the new SNS coasters I rode this year. With the hype that Max Force was getting when it opened, I thought it could possibly be the best coaster in the park. In the end, it wasn't even top three. The launch was good, not my favorite, but good. The high speed roll is a great inversion. The rest of the ride does nothing. The dog tongue is pretty mundane. The max dive loop is braked while you're diving down. I can forgive a short coaster if all the elements pop, but with 1800 feet of track, and most of it being filler, I can't heap the praise onto Max Force. I was pretty disappointed, but that doesn't mean the ride is a waste. Just go in knowing you're gonna get a very good launch and a very good roll, and that's it. Number one, Jersey Devil Coaster at Six Flags Great Adventure. I had to put this as my number one loser. It's the only RMC that I came off of with no desire to ride again. The RMC Raptor has been around for three years now, and I'm used to those trying to rip your head off. Jersey Devil was a mild walk through the park. The drop was decent in the back, but the rest of the coaster seemed to slowly drag me through the elements. That made the stall pretty good, but all the whippy inversions and airtime hills had no bite. I went into this ride knowing it warms up later, and lots of people were unhappy with it early in the day. I can certainly vouch for that. I only had a chance to ride it early, and even though it was a walk-on after I got off, I didn't see the point in riding it again. I want to ride it later in the day, or at night. Maybe this will improve my opinion. That being said, RMC designing a coaster that only runs well in certain conditions, that's not good. I've seen coasters warm up and get better, but to go from a family ride to an extreme ride from day to night, I'd have to see it to believe it. They've replaced the wheels, they've adjusted the mid-course brakes, and all this helps, but unless you ride it after a certain time of day, you're not gonna get that true RMC experience. Those are my 10 losers of my new for 2021 coaster credits. Let me know what you think of these. I'm sure a lot of you disagree with those last five, so let me hear it in the comments below. Before you go, if you can drop a like and give me a sub, I'd appreciate it. Stay tuned for the 10 biggest winners of 2021 coming up later this week. I like to balance the good with the bad, and I have 15 coasters that surprise me in a good way. Also, check out my links below for my Discord server, and my second channel, where I post copyright-free off-ride footage. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.